This episode contains audio and descriptions depicting violence, as well as some harsh language. Please take care when listening. Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Here's what we know. On January 20th, 2020, America recorded its first confirmed case of a novel virus that would come to be called COVID-19. A Washington state resident fell ill after returning from Wuhan, China, where the outbreak began. Cases of the virus first broke out in Washington state, then Illinois, Arizona, California. One case here, two cases there. The novel coronavirus outbreak spreading across the world, now hitting the United States from coast to coast. At the beginning of March, there were 60 reported cases across the country. By March 14th, there were 2,700, and the deaths were only just beginning. So I'm glad to see that you're practicing social distancing. That looks very nice. At a press conference, President Trump, who had initially downplayed the virus, recommended that everyone stay home. As we combat the virus, each and every one of us has a critical role to play in stopping the spread and transmission of the virus. Over the next few days, people cleared grocery store shelves and prepared for the worst. And those who could stayed home, watching the case count rise exponentially. Coronavirus cases here in New York City jumped by more than 6,000 in a single day. Hospitals are at their max. Doctors, nurses face a rising tide. We are scared too. We're fighting for your lives and we're fighting for our own lives. People who were stuck at home praised those doing battle in the hospital, clapping and banging pots and pans in support at the end of every day. And for a few weeks, amid the darkness of what we were facing, America was unified in a way that it hadn't been since 9-11. For a few weeks, partisan hatred was set aside. At first, Everyone seemed to understand the seriousness of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I do mean everyone. Well, I totally agree with you. If you're over really 65 or 70, you damn well better quarantine during this, because you're you're damn right. The, The numbers are clear. Even Alex Jones, perhaps the world's most influential conspiracy theorist, seemed to trust the official guidance at first. You're pointing out them locking things down has now slowed the spread from where that was originally happening. We now see in the models, the lockdowns work. At the very least, Jones knew he could leverage the fear of his viewers and sell a lot of freeze-dried meals. We have storable food in stock, but we have to package it. And virus-killing toothpaste. The Pentagon has come out and documented and said, this stuff kills the whole SARS corona family at point-blank range. Well, of course it does. It kills every virus. But for Jones, the notion that the pandemic was just a pandemic didn't last long. It's all about the new world where you don't get to leave your house unless your smartphone says you're cleared to go. Over the course of three days, Jones went from recommending quarantine to laying out a grand conspiracy. He told his viewers all of this pandemic stuff was just another attempt by the government to control the populace, that the virus was man-made and was being used to depopulate the world. Obama and the U.S. government, the criminals that ran a tent, sold to China. They wanted to depopulate, and they now gave you a soft kill weapon. So you never really know the virus killed you. You're just dead. For Alex Jones, it was just another day at the office. By April, he had abandoned any notion that the lockdown was good. And while we all got loopy in quarantine, he took it to a new level. I will eat my neighbors. I'm not letting my kids die. I'm literally looking at my neighbors now and going... I'm ready to hang them up and gut them and skin them and chop them up. You know what? I'm ready. I'm somebody that thought I could fix this, and I'm starting to think about having to eat my neighbors. This sounds crazy, and it is. But you should know that a lot of people were listening to Alex Jones around this time. The InfoWars website was reportedly getting around 10 million unique visitors a month. That's four times more than Rush Limbaugh's website, and it's even more than legitimate news sites like The Economist. On his show, Jones started promoting the idea that the whole pandemic was a hoax. Mainstream news is running fake videos of people saying they've seen the dead, and it's all fake. He started to cast doubt on the vaccines being produced and warned his listeners that the pandemic was all part of the New World Order conspiracy. 
This is the revolution against humanity. This is the globalist takeover. The federal government under Trump had issued guidance to stay home, but many state governors had taken it upon themselves to implement stay-at-home orders, mandates that carried penalties for people who broke them. And by mid-April, it was becoming clear that Alex Jones was far from the only person who was sick of the lockdown. We are certainly in for a wild day in our state. You're looking live at our state capitol, surrounded by protesters this noon. The battle started in Michigan on April 15, 2020. Protesters converged on Lansing, gathering at the state capitol building and blocking the street in an anti-lockdown protest they dubbed Operation Gridlock. Well, Emily, there are a lot of cars, as you can tell, and they have been here since very early this morning. In fact, when I- Car horns blared, and the traffic jam kept doctors and nurses from getting to their shift at a local hospital. And then the protesters headed for the state capitol building. They're here, they're on the Capitol steps, staging a more traditional protest here. For many of the protesters, the grievance was legitimate. They were employed in the trades and wanted to go back to work. The people of Michigan will not put up with their rights taken away. If I don't make money, my family doesn't eat. The footage is reminiscent of the Bundy standoff. Lots of yellow don't tread on me flags and American flags. The occasional guy in camo carrying an assault rifle. But now, things were different. Most of these people weren't part of a militia. They were just ordinary citizens. In the lockdown protests, President Donald Trump saw an opportunity to galvanize his base. This was an election year, and the pandemic had killed the booming economy he had presided over. Just four weeks after he'd recommended social distancing, Trump sent out a series of tweets. Liberate Minnesota, said one. Liberate Michigan, said the second. Liberate Virginia and save your great Second Amendment. It is under siege, said the third. Over the next couple of weeks, anti-lockdown protests quickly spread to 30 states, and heavily armed far-right militias showed up to a lot of them. And so did a group called the Proud Boys a white power street fighting gang that had come to fame beating up left-wing protesters at rallies over the years. Alex Jones showed up to a protest in Texas, riding in the back of his InfoWars branded tank. America will reopen! Texas is leading the war! All across the country, far-right groups were blending in with average Trump supporters in shows of force at state capitol buildings. Sometimes they influenced the growing violent rhetoric. In Kentucky, protesters hung an effigy of Governor Andy Bashir from a tree, and written across its chest were the same words that had been written on Timothy McVeigh's shirt the day he blew up the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Sick semper tyrannis, thus ever to tyrants. The anti-government ideology that had been simmering since Ruby Ridge was starting to boil over. Back in Michigan, where all of this anti-lockdown fervor had started two weeks before, a group of armed militiamen pushed their way into the Capitol building, demanding to be let into the Senate chamber. State senators were inside conducting a session. Some donned bulletproof vests. Eventually, militiamen with assault rifles were allowed to enter the gallery above the Senate floor. Some of them screamed down at the state senators. The protest was teetering on the edge of anti-government violence. But at the end of it all, only one protester was arrested. Some of the militiamen present that day would be arrested months later for plotting to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Outside the Capitol building that day, a militiaman held a sign that read, Tyrants Get the Rope. It was a reference to a day dreamt of in the Turner Diaries, a day when white revolutionaries and average people would come together to hang politicians, journalists, and other race traitors en masse. The pandemic had inflamed an already explosive political climate. 
white power groups believed that they had finally arrived at the divisive moment they'd been waiting for. Now, all they needed was a spark to ignite a race war and achieve their ultimate goal of overthrowing the federal government. I'm Garrett Graff, and this is Long Shadow, Rise of the American Far Right. Episode 7, Day of the Rope. This morning, a man is dead after being arrested by Minneapolis police, and video has emerged online with many people upset about how officers handled the situation. Rob Olson is live. He's at the 3rd Precinct. On May 25, 2020, while anti-lockdown protests were still unfolding across the country, a 46-year-old black man named George Floyd was murdered by a white police officer named Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis. Get him off the ground, you're being a bum right now. Were, were you, you here the whole time? Video of the incident went viral, shot by bystanders in broad daylight. He enjoying that shit right now, bro. Chauvin knelt on Floyd's neck for over nine minutes, staring down the cameras filming him while people begged him to stop. Bro, look, well, you should check on him. He's not responsive oh, right now. Back off. Floyd's last words were, I can't breathe. I can't breathe! I can't breathe! The killing sparked some of the largest protests the country had ever seen. I can't breathe! I can't breathe! They started in Minneapolis and spread to all 50 states. That could be my father, that could be my brother, that could be me. The vast majority, over 90% of these protests, were peaceful. But in some places, anger over centuries of police brutality and inaction boiled over. Riots broke out in some cities. Arson, vandalism, and looting would ultimately do over a billion dollars in damage. It's a scene of utter chaos. Right now, this fire is raging out of control. In Minneapolis, rioters burned down a police station, an image that would play again and again on network news. Mobs of violent cretins have burned our cities shot police officers, and stolen everything in sight. Although the protests were largely peaceful, there was a narrative being spun in right-wing media that riots, lawlessness, and violence were widespread. Criminals, anarchists, those looting and burning, wreaking havoc on the streets of our cities. If you watched Fox News at the time, it felt like the country was in the midst of a civil war. Fox commentators drew the battle lines along party lines. Conservatives wanted law and order. Liberals wanted riots and chaos. Commentators like Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson demanded that police do more to quell the unrest. These are the worst people in America, and our leaders have let them do whatever they want. Why did the police retreat? Why didn't you restore order? Get the fuck up! As if in response to Fox's condemnation, police units across the country started to crack down. Amid nationwide protests of police brutality, dozens of videos emerged of cops violently attacking protesters. They beat people with clubs, maced peaceful crowds, fired rubber bullets, and even hit protesters with their cars. With all the high-profile cases of police brutality over the years, cops had become more careful, especially when the cameras were on. This is certainly, this is proof. Now, some were attacking and arresting journalists on live television. All across the country, some law enforcement units seemed to be making an authoritarian statement. And then, on June 1st, President Trump decided to make a statement of his own. My fellow Americans, my first and highest duty as president is to defend our great country and the American people. While Trump gave a speech in which he threatened to use the military to quell the protests, outside the White House, federal officers attacked protesters and journalists alike with tear gas and rubber bullets as they cleared people off the street. When they were finished, Trump walked out of the White House, through Lafayette Square, and stood in front of a church holding up a copy of the Bible. We have a great country. That's my thoughts. Given everything the country was going through, the symbolism was clear. This was no call for peace, no message of hope or unity. 
this was a war, and Trump had chosen his side. Standing with white Christian tradition as police attacked protesters demonstrating for people of color. At the beginning of this series, I told you that white power groups like the KKK once saw themselves as aiding law enforcement and the federal government in preserving white supremacy. But when the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964, those groups felt betrayed by the government and started plotting to overthrow it. 2020 was another watershed year for the far right. They had a sympathetic regime in the Trump administration, but that administration was in peril from the impending election, from investigations and impeachments, from what the far right called the deep state, a shadow government out to undermine Trump and destroy America. Like the KKK once had, far right groups once again saw themselves in support of the government, Trump's government. Yeah, so this this whole whole parking lot is full of these 3%er patriot type motherfuckers. Militias we've mentioned throughout this series like the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters who were involved in the standoff at the Bundy Ranch, started showing up at the protests, armed to the teeth. These are militia that are here to protect us, apparently, or protect whatever. Some of these militias came under the guise of protecting the First Amendment rights of protesters. Others were there as vigilantes who would keep order if the police failed to. But there were even more dangerous groups lurking in the crowds that summer anti-government extremist group known as the Boogaloo Movement. The Boogaloo Boys looked like your typical heavily armed militiamen, except that they wore Hawaiian shirts under their tactical gear. The group had been formed as half of a joke on 4chan, the online forum that had become a popular gathering place for the far right in the Trump era. As they stood in the streets with assault rifles at the protests in 2020, The Boogaloo Boys claimed to be there to protect the First Amendment, but their beliefs were directly in line with extreme white supremacist groups of the 80s, like the Order. They were preparing for and hoping to incite a second American Civil War, which they called the Boogaloo, which would bring about the collapse of our democracy as we know it. Three Las Vegas men now facing federal charges for allegedly inciting violence at some of those local protests. In May of 2020, three Boogaloo boys were arrested at a Las Vegas protest. The three men were determined to incite violence, which included a plan to burn police with Molotov cocktails during a Black Lives Matter protest. With all of these heavily armed far-right groups hanging around the protests happening across the country, it was inevitable that catastrophe would strike. Okay, I worked, I worked at that business. Kyle Rittenhouse wasn't even a member of any particular militia. He was just a 17-year-old kid from Illinois who loved Trump, backed the police, and owned an assault rifle. On August 25th, he traveled to Kenosha, Wisconsin, which was experiencing unrest after a police shooting there. People are getting injured, and our job is to protect this business. Rittenhouse was roving around the city with a group of heavily armed Boogaloo boys, hoping to stop protesters damaging private property. When a protester chased him, Rittenhouse turned and fired, killing him. him, A group of protesters then went after Rittenhouse, attempting to stop him. He stumbled and fell, and from the ground fired multiple shots, killing another person and wounding a third. When it was all over, Rittenhouse walked toward police with his hands up. but they ignored him, driving past him toward the protesters. So are you really surprised that looting and arson accelerated to murder? Rittenhouse became a cause celeb on the right. On Fox News, Tucker Carlson justified Rittenhouse's actions and seemed to promote others doing the same. How shocked are we that 17-year-olds with rifles decided they had to maintain order when no one else would? There is ample research that shows that those thousands of protests across the country in the summer of 2020 were overwhelmingly peaceful. This is Andy Campbell, 
a reporter at the Huffington Post covering far-right hate groups. But if you watched Fox News in 2020, you still think to this day that there are cities on fire because of those BLM protests. How many innocent Americans have these people hurt? How many have they murdered? We don't know that number. The damage, the carnage, the records now will go on for years as a result of this. This chaos needs to end, it needs to end now. By mid-2020, helped in part by Fox News, there was a growing notion, even on the mainstream right, that law enforcement wasn't enough to quell the civil unrest, and that violence by militias and private citizens like Kyle Rittenhouse might be necessary. A good swath of the country that followed Trump through his election believe that violence is a justified option in politics now. This was a very galvanizing event for all of far-right extremism that created a narrative that police weren't enough to fight back. We needed these extremist forces. And there was one far-right group in particular that wasn't afraid to use violence in broad daylight. A group that by mid-2020 had risen to become the darling of the right-wing media sphere. The Proud Boys embody this new era of American extremism. Although they take pains to hide it, the Proud Boys are essentially a pro-Trump, white power street gang. In the summer of 2020, they had 43 chapters across the country and frequently showed up to George Floyd protests to fight with leftists. By August, these clashes were centered in the Proud Boys stronghold of Portland, Oregon. This became a battleground where Proud Boys and often law enforcement would go toe-to-toe with locals and counter-protesters. They're wearing MAGA hats, they're wearing their black and yellow polos, and they were just like a drunken, brawling fight club. This mass of black and yellow that moved through the crowds, ready to fight and punch anything. And unlike the masked groups or the neo-Nazis or the Klan who often shield their faces, these guys wanted to be known. They wanted to talk to me, which is always concerning. If somebody is out there committing violence and they want to give their name to a reporter, they were proud of what they were doing. Portland is the place where the Proud Boys proved themselves to the right and positioned what they were doing as in defense of right-wing causes rather than just being a hate group in the street. But the Proud Boys were a hate group with white power ideology at their core. They're self-described Western chauvinists who believe that white men have created everything of societal value. They often make reference to the 14 words a mission statement created by one of the leaders of the order back in the 1980s. We must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. It was an oath commonly taken by white supremacists and neo-Nazis. But the Proud Boys kept their white power core under wraps. They knew not to use hate symbols like swastikas and even allowed people of color to join their ranks. As long as they agree that white men are overwhelmingly responsible for the success of Western culture. Because they weren't outwardly racist and appeared to be tackling the perceived widespread lawlessness in America's streets, the Proud Boys became heroes with a mainstream right. By the fall of 2020, thanks to Fox News and Alex Jones, they had become a household name. There's this group, the Proud Boys. They're attacked by being accused of being a group of, oh, white men. Like I- What a good, wholesome organization that supports every American's right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Their star had risen so much, they even had an in with the Trump administration. Roger Stone, who had advised Trump for decades, was also something of an honorary Proud Boy. He sometimes used Proud Boys as security guards and had even taken the Proud Boys' oath. Hi, I'm Roger Stone. I'm a Western chauvinist. And I refuse to apologize for the hated modern world. If you missed that, he said, I am a Western chauvinist, and I refuse to apologize for creating the modern world. It's uh, this new era of buttoned-up 
online focused extremism that is totally connected to Trump's inner circle. So we have to win the election. We can't play games. Get out and vote. The presidential election was looming, and Trump, maybe sensing it wasn't going to go his way, started to cast doubt on it. In August, he said, The only way we're going to lose this election is if the election is rigged. Remember that. Over the years, Trump had often balked at disavowing white supremacy. And at a presidential debate on September 29th, moderator Chris Wallace had had enough. Are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups and to say that they need to stand down and not add to the violence in a number of these cities as we've seen in Portland? Are you prepared to to specifically? Donald Trump is asked to disavow the Proud Boys specifically. And instead of disavow them, he says, Proud Boys, stand back and stand by. The Proud Boys took that as marching orders. They immediately set their sights on violence if Trump doesn't win. It is finally here. It's Election Day 2020, and the big prize tonight, of course, is the race for the White House. On November 3rd, 2020, millions of Americans went to their polling places and cast their vote for president. Millions more mailed their ballots in to avoid crowded spaces in the middle of the ongoing pandemic. Good morning, everybody. Almost 2 a.m. in the East. Casey, we got a race going tonight. And by the end of election night, Biden appeared to have the edge. But with so many mail-in ballots uncounted, it was impossible to call. But that didn't stop President Trump from giving it a try anyway. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. Trump claimed victory early in the morning after Election Day and called for vote counting to stop across the country. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at 4 o'clock in the morning and add them to the list, okay? The phrase Stop the Steal was actually originated all the way back in 2016 by Trump's advisor, Roger Stone. At the time, the Trump campaign was planning to dispute a potential loss to Hillary Clinton. And after Election Day in 2020, Stone's associates put the phrase into action. Stop the Steal was promoted by Trump and spread through a vast network of far-right groups through the social media handles of militia groups like the Three Percenters and Oath Keepers, through QAnon conspiracy groups on Facebook, through the online presence of the increasingly popular Proud Boys. On Fox News, false rumors of election fraud were promoted by host after host and broadcast to millions of viewers. And the Stop the Steal movement quickly turned into action in the streets. The day after Election Day, Crowds of Trump supporters started showing up at polling places in states that were still counting ballots, like Arizona, Michigan, and Nevada. Sometimes accompanied by armed militias, they banged on the windows trying to intimidate election workers inside. But despite Trump's attempts to stop it, the vote count continued. And on November 7th, news networks started calling the race. CNN projects Joseph R. Biden Jr. is elected the 46th president of the United States, winning the White House. But for Trump and his allies all across the right, the battle was far from over. Trump's lawyers attempted to overturn election results on meritless accusations of voter fraud. And Alex Jones, who prided himself on getting Trump elected in 2016, took on a key role in the Stop the Steal movement. Get out there, take action, legally, peacefully, take action now, Paul Revere's, or be slaves forever. Jones, Roger Stone, and a far-right influencer named Ali Alexander planned a series of Trump rallies called Million MAGA Marches. On November 11th, a few days before the first Million MAGA March, Stuart Rhodes, the leader of the Oath Keepers, was on Jones's show. We have men already stationed outside D.C. as a nuclear option in case they attempt to remove the president illegally. 
we will step in and stop it. Rhodes was threatening violent action if Trump was removed. Stuart, can you not feel history happening right now? I mean, it's happening right now. A few days later, on November 14th, Jones and thousands of Trump supporters marched on Washington, D.C. Joe Biden's going to prison. He's not going to the White House. Jones was flanked by a security detail of Oath Keepers and Proud Boys. When Trump did not win, the Proud Boys began calling for civil war. They began amassing equipment. They began amassing recruits. They pulled together all of the money that they'd made, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they set their sights on Washington. At the second Million MAGA march on December 12th, Jones ratcheted up the violent rhetoric. We will never give up. We will never surrender. We will never back down to the satanic, pedophile, globalist, new world order. Oath Keepers leader Stuart Rhodes called for Trump to impose martial law and threatened violence if he didn't. That he does not do it now while he is commander in chief, we're going to have to do it ourselves later in a much more desperate, much more bloody war. After the rally, a group of Proud Boys, including leader Enrique Tario, put those violent words into action. Tario led a group of them marching through the streets of D.C., attacking people, shouting, fuck the media, fuck Antifa. I spoke to reporters who they attacked. I spoke to a a woman who was stabbed by the Proud Boys. It was just a raucous, violent affair. Enrique Tarrio marches with these Proud Boys in front of historic black churches that had BLM banners hanging up. They ripped them down. Enrique led several of them to burn a BLM banner in front of a historic black church there in D.C. The officials at this church went on to say in court when Enrique was arrested over this incident, what does it look like to you if you're sitting in a historic black church and you're looking out as a group of mostly angry white men is burning something in your front yard? It sort of evokes a darker time in this country's history. Leading up to January 6th, it was clear that you had this huge, rabid, activated army under Trump ready to do something for him. The many Stop the Steal rallies held across the country did nothing to change the election outcome. Trump's legal team was losing every court case and time was ticking down to the certification of election results on January 6th. In the view of many on the far right, there was really only one person who could stop that from happening. Mike Pence's moment of destiny awaits him, and it's coming on the 6th of January. After guiding Trump to the presidency in 2016, Steve Bannon had been cast out of the Trump White House. He'd even earned a nickname from Trump, Sloppy Steve. But Bannon remained a key player in the MAGA movement. And ever since Election Day 2020, he had been pushing the voter fraud conspiracy to his army of rabid listeners on his War Room podcast. He was eager to help Trump keep his office at all costs. There's a lot happening this week. People are getting revved up. People are getting fired up. People are getting madder, as they should. Bannon saw stopping the election certification as the last chance for the MAGA movement he'd helped create. According to the book Peril by Bob Woodward and Robert Costa, on December 30th, Bannon called Trump at Mar-a-Lago and told him to get back to D.C. as soon as possible. We're going to kill it in its crib, Bannon said. Kill the Biden presidency in its crib. The next day, Trump arrived back at the White House. Mr. President, why are you fighting the election? By the morning of January 5th, 2020, almost all the far-right elements we've discussed in recent episodes assembled in Washington, D.C. for the final Million MAGA March event. Patriots, 
the Oath Keepers stashed a large amount of weapons in a hotel room in nearby Virginia, including assault rifles and ammunition, in case they were needed to help keep Trump in power. The Proud Boys were scattered across the D.C. area, instructed by their leader, Enrique Tarrio, to not wear their black and yellow uniforms on January 6th in order to blend in better with the crowd. Later on in the evening, Tario and Oath Keepers leader Stuart Rhodes had a brief meeting in a D.C. parking garage. Hey, Stuart, pleasure. Stuart. Pleasure's on mine, Hey, listen. Tario was being followed by a documentary film crew that captured the meeting, and he asked the crew to step away while he talked with Rhodes and others. Off to the side, a man who came to the meeting with Rhodes was heard saying, it's inevitable what's going to happen. We've just got to do it as a team together, strong, hard, and fast. But before all of that, at around 9 a.m. on the morning of the 5th, according to White House phone logs, Trump called Steve Bannon. And not long after, Bannon took to his podcast to talk about what would happen the next day. It's all converging, and now we're on, as they say, the point of attack, right? The point of attack tomorrow. I'll tell you this. It's not going to happen like you think it's going to happen, okay? It's going to be quite extraordinarily different. And all I can say is strap in. Bannon was reporting from a hotel room looking down on Freedom Plaza, where Trump supporters were gathering to hear a slate of radical speakers deemed too extreme to share the stage at Trump's rally the next day. I declare unto you that Donald Trump is going to remain the president of the United States of America. We're not going to fall to socialism. We're not going to fall to communism. Up the street in the Oval Office, Trump opened a door onto the Rose Garden so he could hear the crowd. According to the book Peril, Vice President Mike Pence stopped by the Oval Office later that evening. Trump asked him to throw out the electors and let Congress decide the election. Pence responded that he didn't have the authority to do that. And then Trump gestured behind him at the crowd down at Freedom Plaza. What if these people say you do? Trump asked. If these people say you have the power, wouldn't you want to? I wouldn't want any one person to have that authority, Pence said. When Pence left, Trump opened the door of the Oval Office again and stood outside in the freezing cold, listening to the adoring crowd down the street. And that brings us back to where we started this whole saga. The night of January 5th, 2020. A moment right at the precipice of history. A big crowd is here for Alex Jones' speech. You see red hats with MAGA on them and people draped in American flags. But if you know what you're looking for, you see other things too. An Oath Keeper's logo here. Body armor. Camo. You can see a dark shadow cast from way back in time, when a few ragtag groups of white supremacists dreamed of overthrowing the U.S. government and creating a white nation. They never dreamed of a moment like this. On the early morning of January 6th, the Oath Keepers were up and about, making preparations. At around 6.30, Stuart Rhodes warned his group members that it was illegal to carry blades over three inches long in D.C. and to keep their knives low profile. By 10 a.m., a massive crowd of Trump supporters was gathering at the Ellipse, in front of the White House, where Donald Trump was expected to speak. 
But down the street, a throng of Proud Boys was already making their way to the Capitol building. Proud of your boy! Proud of your boy! And the Capitol Police were already nervous. Yeah, just for awareness, be advised, there's probably about 300 uh, Proud Boys. They're marching eastbound towards the United States Capitol. Who speaks our streets? Who speaks our streets? At noon, Trump took the stage at the Ellipse, this time in front of a crowd that was truly worth bragging about. It's uh, just a great honor to have this kind of crowd and to be before you and hundreds of thousands of American patriots are committed to the honesty of our elections. And the Trump knew that there was this rabid fan base full of armed extremists who were ready to do whatever it took to overturn the results of the election. Thank you. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. They saw January 6th as their last stand for Donald Trump. After this, we're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. With that, people started moving towards the U.S. Capitol building. Alex Jones was at the head of one crowd with his protege, Owen Schroyer. We're coming for all you commie traitors in Congress that have stabbed us in the back. After months of spewing violent rhetoric, Jones might have sensed that this was about to go sideways. He bullhorned for a peaceful demonstration. And we're coming with truth and justice and non-violent civil disobedience. His shouts seemed to fall on deaf ears. By 1250, while Trump was still speaking, Proud Boys in plain clothes were stacked up with other Trump supporters at a barricade at what's known as Peace Circle just south of the U.S. Capitol grounds. Proud Boy higher-up Joe Biggs was seen on film speaking to a young man in a denim jacket. Two minutes later, that man initiated a push against the Capitol Police and the barricade. Two minutes after that, the barricade was overrun and people started spilling onto the Capitol grounds. By then, Trump had finished speaking, and thousands more people were making their way to the Capitol, where police were already struggling to keep people out. Inside, Congress was getting ready to certify the vote. The Vice President and the United States Senate. By 2 p.m., the Capitol Police outside were losing control. The rioters made it to the inner plaza, and suddenly they were at the foot of the Capitol building, and there were not enough police to hold them. The people rushing the building had come from all over the country. They were QAnon believers, off-duty law enforcement officers, veterans. They were local and state politicians. They were regular people. Since the election, they had been told by everyone, from Alex Jones to the president himself, that they would have to fight. And that's exactly what they did. Rioters beat Capitol Police with flagpoles and other weapons they brought along. And then they broke through. Thousands poured up the steps and viciously fought against the last line of police officers. It was a proud boy, Dominic Pizzola, who was the first to breach the Capitol using a riot shield that he stole from a police officer. Smashes a window that becomes a portal by which thousands of other people go in and out of the Capitol building. We have a breach of the Capitol! Breach of the Capitol! And then Dominic Pizzola goes inside the Capitol, lights a cigar, and says into a selfie video. Victory smoke in the Capitol, boys. I knew we could take this motherfucker over if we just tried hard enough. I knew we could take this motherfucker over if we just tried hard enough. Proud of your boy. Without objection, the chair declares the House in recess pursuant to Clause 12B of Rule 1. At 2.20, eight minutes after the first rioter entered the Capitol, Congress adjourned and the members were moved to secure locations while thousands more people poured into the building. 
In all the mayhem, Oath Keeper's members entered the capital in full tactical gear and split into groups, hoping to find House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. A few days later, Oath Keeper's leader Stuart Rhodes would be caught on an FBI recording, saying that his only regret was that they didn't bring rifles. I'd hang fucking Pelosi from the lamppost, he added. The Oath Keepers weren't the only ones looking for the speaker that day. Outside, someone had built a gallows with a noose. The crowd cheered, hang Mike Pence. For some of the far-right leaders in attendance, it must have felt like the long-awaited day of the rope had arrived at last. Rioters and militiamen hunted the Capitol for congressmen. At around 3 p.m., rioters broke out windows, trying to gain access to the House chamber. A 36-year-old woman named Ashley Babbitt, an ardent believer in the QAnon conspiracy, attempted to climb through the window. She was fatally shot by a Capitol Police officer on the other side. The forces that brought Ashley Babbitt to that moment are the same forces that pushed the far right into the mainstream in America. She was a veteran who felt disillusioned by the government, became an ardent fan of President Trump, and then a believer in the QAnon conspiracy. And like many of those who rushed to the Capitol that day, she saw herself as the hero of the story, fighting against the forces of evil. To the average person watching at home, the insurrection might have just looked like an overzealous protest. But to those who knew the far-right movement, including some of the people we've talked to over the course of this project, it looked very different. Seeing what was happening at the Capitol on January 6th was the culmination of the movement I had been covering, writing about, investigating for close to 30 years. Mark Potok, who had reported on Waco and Oklahoma City and spent decades at the Southern Poverty Law Center covering the far right, was both shocked and unsurprised. There was a real radical right growing, and most Americans were uh, very loath to admit it, and in particular law enforcement agencies and people in government. January 6th was the announcement to the world that the radical right has absolutely penetrated and in some ways swamped the political mainstream. What we're seeing now is a situation where many Americans are willing to contemplate violent revolution. We are confronted with the specter of real life authoritarianism that has some real fascist elements. We are in danger as a society. After the January 6th insurrection, more than 800 people were charged for entering the U.S. Capitol. Over 200 were charged with assaulting, resisting, or impeding police officers. More than 30 members of far-right groups were charged with conspiracy. Four members of the Oath Keepers, including Stuart Rhodes, and four members of the Proud Boys, including Enrique Tarrio, were tried and convicted of seditious conspiracy, a charge just under treason. There have been serious repercussions for many who were involved in the January 6th attack. But America's problem with the far right is far from over. Back in the 1980s, when we started this story, far-right groups were seen as the lunatic fringe. Today, their members inhabit every level of public office, from county sheriffs and mayors to state senators and even members of Congress. During the 2022 midterms, 37 candidates from 17 states were believers in the far-right QAnon conspiracy. Three were elected, including Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is now one of the most famous members of the U.S. House of Representatives. Q is someone very close to President Trump. According to him, many in our government are actively worshiping Satan. Although some of the Proud Boys leadership has been convicted of serious crimes and is likely headed to prison, the group itself isn't going anywhere. 
Recently, they've been disrupting, of all things, children's story hours that feature drag queens. It's part of a broader mainstream hate movement against LGBTQ people going on right now. But the Proud Boys are actually trying to move away from street violence and toward getting members elected to public office. And ever since January 6th, violent attacks by far-right extremist groups have grown. It now sadly feels like a regular part of our news cycle. An armed man killed in a shootout after trying to breach the FBI's Cincinnati office. In August 2022, an Iraq war veteran who had stormed the Capitol tried to storm the FBI field office in Cincinnati, armed with a nail gun and an AR-15. He was killed in a shootout with police. In October of 2022, Nancy Pelosi's husband, Paul Pelosi, was brutally attacked by a QAnon believer wielding a hammer. The suspect's alleged online social media pages show multiple false conspiracy theories relating to COVID-19, the 2020 election, and the federal government. And there are still organized white supremacist groups out there hoping to start a race war. Authorities said they had foiled an alleged neo-Nazi plot to attack... Members of the neo-Nazi group Adam Waffen took a page straight from the Turner Diaries and mounted attacks on the electrical grid by shooting at power stations. Attacks on the power grid are actually becoming widespread. Extremists adhering to a range of ideologies will likely continue to plot and encourage physical attacks against power networks. Hate-fueled mass shootings inspired by the massacres at Tree of Life and Christ Church have continued in places like Buffalo. Breaking news, at least 10 people are dead in a mass shooting. Oregon. We start with a mass shooting at a protest. In Colorado Springs. We begin with breaking news this morning. At least five people have been killed and 18 injured in a mass shooting at a gay nightclub. Now, more than ever before, we are in the shadow cast across history by the far right. If there's light at the end of this tunnel, it's that the U.S. government has finally taken a real and sustained interest in the domestic terrorism threat posed by the far right. In the coming years, a decision looms on our horizon. Are we going to reject white nationalism and right-wing political violence? Or are we going to turn away while it consumes our democracy? The time to make that choice is closer than you think. It's March 25th, 2023, at the regional airport in Waco, Texas. Exactly 30 years ago, 15 miles from here, the federal government was in the middle of the standoff with the Branch Davidians that would ultimately end in disaster and give birth to the far-right movement as we know it. Today, the leader of that movement is here. Donald Trump has chosen this place to kick off his 2024 presidential campaign. At this moment, various investigations into Trump's criminal conduct are still ongoing. Cases focused on election fraud, mishandling classified documents, hush money payments, and his role in instigating the riot on January 6th. More than anything else, he has made it clear that this bid for the presidency is about one thing. Revenge. In 2016, I declared, I am your voice. And now I say to you again tonight, I am your warrior. I am your justice. And I took a lot of heat for this one, but I only mean it in the proper way for those who have been wronged and betrayed, of which there are many people out there that have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. We will take care of it. We will take care of it. Either the deep state destroys America or we destroy the deep state. That's the way it's gotta be. We're at a very pivotal point in our country. We are at a very pivotal point in our country. Thank you for listening with us all the way to the end. It's been an honor to help tell the story of this weird moment in our history, and I hope you'll stick around for future seasons of Long Shadow. 
If you want to know more about the Proud Boys and how the right-wing street gang ushered in a new era of American extremism, pick up Andy Campbell's book, We Are Proud Boys. Long Shadow Rise of the American Far Right is a co-production of Longlead and Campside Media. The show is produced by Ryan Swikert. Callie Hitchcock is our associate producer. Executive producers are John Patrick Pullen and Josh Dean, who also served as Long Shadow story editors. Audience development by Heather Muse. Will DeGravio is our research assistant. Fact-checking by Rebecca Holland. Claire Mullen did the mix. Sound design by Ryan Swikert. Music by Blue Dot Sessions and APM. Cover art by Longlead's creative director, Sarah Rogers. A special thanks to Jennifer Bassett, who consulted on the podcast. Learn more about Longlead and subscribe to our newsletter at longlead.com. If you've enjoyed this show, spread the word and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find the show. I'm Garrett Graff, and thanks for listening.